Good morning, guys. All right, I'm going to open with prayer. Father, thank you for this chance to get together. Thank you we have the freedom to do this. Thank you for the friendships that are in this room. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Um, Paul prayed that we would be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I pray this morning that he will fill this room and that you will give us greater understanding of this great gift that you've given us. We look forward in advance, and it's in our Savior's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, for, you know, Jesus had handpicked his disciples, and for three years they did life together. They hung out together. Jesus taught them. He was their rabbi. And the crowds were growing. More and more people wanted to be around Jesus just to see him, to hear his teaching, to see the miracles. And so they were increasing in excitement, but the religious leaders were increasing in their disillusionment. They were mad, they were upset, and they were plotting to arrest Jesus when the crowd wasn't around and then have him put to death. And so Jesus was forewarning the disciples, saying, the time is coming when I'm not going to be with you anymore. But they weren't understanding it, and they didn't want to hear it. <laughs> and so now it's Passover week, and they're in Jerusalem, and they're having dinner together. And Jesus says, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And God will be glorified with what's about ready to happen. And then he said, I'm not going to be with you very much longer. And where I'm going, you can't go. But I give you a new commandment, love one another. If you love each other, the world's going to know that you're my disciple just by the way they watch you. Agape, love each other. And then Peter says, where are you going? Wherever you go, I want to go. And Jesus says, you can't. Where you're going, where I'm going, you can't go with me. And then Jesus says, and then Peter says, Jesus, I'm ready to die for you. Wherever you're going, I'll go. And Jesus says, Peter, before the cock crows tomorrow morning, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. And then he looks at the disciples and he says, don't be troubled because he sees the trouble on their, that, that's, that's in their eyes, and he says, don't be troubled. In my Father's house, there's many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, you can be also. And you know the way. So Thomas says, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then Philip says, well, hey, wait, I've got it. Just show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus says, you've been with me for how long and you still don't get this? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And then he says, you're going to be able to do more things than, I've, than I, even I could do because of this gift I'm going to give you. And then go to your table card. Go to the top verse. I didn't put it on here, but the lead in to John, 4, John 14, verse 16 is verse 15. And Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will abide in you. So Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So there's a bar, right? The bar that we have is the commandments that, that we get from God. It was the 10 commandments to start with, but Jesus actually, when he came, he didn't abolish the bar. He raised the bar. If you go, if you want to have a good starting place on this, just go to the Sermon on the Mount. That's exactly what he said. I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to accomplish it. And then he started talking. He said, you've heard it said, if you kill somebody, you're going to be judged. I say, if you're angry with somebody, you'll be judged. 
You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say, if you look at a woman and lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Jesus, the bar is getting higher. <laughs> I, use, I put this prop up here for a very specific reason. Pole vaulting is, is really unique, right? Uh, we mentioned it just briefly last week. But of all the events, I, I would, I'm going to date myself. 1972, I'm a junior in high school. The Summer Olympics are 1972. Coach Colander <laughs> is our gym coach. He also was my baseball coach. But he took the class and said, guys, I want you to experience the Olympics. So we did everything that, what the summer, that track and field had for the Summer Olympics. So we did javelin throw, shot put, <laughs> this throw, various, various you know, dashes, hurdle jumping. The most unique one was this one. So in pole vaulting, you're given a 14-foot pole. It looks like this. And that's what helps you get over the bar, right? You take a running start, you stick it in the ground, and it vaults you over the top. Well, there's a trick to it. You don't start out here and put the thing in. You actually start, you want to plant the, the bar in the ground right over there and then go straight up and up over the top. So that bar right there looks pretty tall, doesn't it? That's about what we did in high school. The ceiling's not tall enough in here. The poles are, but we can't get it up that high. You got to go up another five and a half feet to go to where the Olympic jumpers do. Absolutely amazing, isn't it? The bar is, the bar is up there. So you can look at that and say, that's too high, I'm going home, right? There's three, three different ways of looking at that. You can look at it and say, I'll pole vault, but lower the bar. <laughs> Bring that down about three feet and I'll give it a try. Or you can say, give me the pole. So in our Christian life, guys, that's the three things that men do. That's what we do. I had a friend uh, when I lived in Milwaukee. He was an Olympic skater. He married one of the Green Bay Jack Packer cheerleaders when Green Bay Packers had cheerleaders. <laughs> and so he was well known. He was involved in Fellowship of Christian Athletes, very active in the community. And one day he said, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look after my wife and kids because I'm checking out. I'm going to Colorado and I'm just not going to I'm just not going to do this anymore. He walked away from his faith. <laughs> he walked away from everything that he said he stood for. And so I asked him why. I mean, what brought you this? Why are you doing this? He said, it's too tough. The demands are too high. He was put on a pedestal. He felt it in his own flesh. He couldn't do it. And so he just checked out and walked away. The bar was too high. That's what some guys do. We just walk away because... Christianity is too hard. Some guys just lower the bar. All those expectations are a little bit too much. I'll make my own rules. I'll set the bar where I feel like I can accomplish it, and that's how I'll live my life. But if we understand the pull, we don't have to lower the bar because Jesus puts something inside of us that helps us launch over the bar that he created. If you love me, <laughs> keep my commandments. And I'm going to give you a helper, and he's going to abide inside of you. And he will empower you to do whatever it is that I ask you to do. So what's the pull that we need to embrace? If we want to live this Christian life, we can't do that on our own. <laughs> There's no way we can do this on our own. What's this pull? That we, that we need to embrace. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the pole. And so, what about the Holy Spirit do we need to know? Well, there's going to be way too much in this topic to cover in one morning, certainly. But take out uh, the going deeper verses. Here are some of the things the Holy Spirit does for us. I, if I would go through these, we'd have no time at the tables. <laughs> But I'm going to give them to you so you can spend some time with them. I'm going to tell you, if you spend an hour studying this, you'll spend the next 10 years just living it more and more and more and grasping it more and more. What does the Holy Spirit does for us? Well, look at this. He's our helper. He teaches us. He'll bring to remembrance certain things. Have you had that happen? 
or you read something in the Bible, now you're talking to somebody, and all of a sudden, it just comes back. That's the Holy Spirit helping you with that. Bring into remembrance the things that you studied. You do your part, he can do his. We've got to give things for the Holy Spirit to work with. He will testify about Jesus and all the works and why it makes sense. What, what all is it that Jesus did? What was going on? He'll convict us concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He'll guide us in all truth. There's a lot of different opinions floating around. A lot of different ideas on what's what. We can't take just any one thing. The Bible explains the Bible. So the more that we're in it, the more the Holy Spirit teaches us, the more he's going to lead us to truth, to well-rounded, balanced truth. He will glorify God through us. He gives us power. He empowers us. He helps our weakness. He testifies. He'll testify within you that, yes, you are a son of God. Yes, your faith is real. You would not be having this. You would not be experiencing this if your faith was not real. He gives gifts. He apportions out gifts. Every man in this room, we all have unique, special gifts. So he gives us what we need to fulfill what he's called us to do. He'll speak directly to us. We talked about that last week. We'll hear his voice. He'll instruct us. He dwells inside of us, and he fills us. So, take a look at the um, very last verse on the key verses. This is what Paul's prayer was for the Corinthians and his prayer for us. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. He prayed that we, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with us. What is that? What's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? That word fellowship is koinonia. And, you know, we're always limited by the English language, right? Fellowship of the Holy Spirit isn't... That's, that sounds like a nice blessing to say at the end of this thing today, right? <laughs> well, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the koinonia has three dimensions to it, okay? And, and the first one is companionship. Last week when we were done with one thing, um, a bunch of us went out to breakfast and then eight of us went golfing. My brother jumped in the golf cart with me, and I haven't seen my brother for a while. But what we had was companionship. So we didn't play golf for four hours and not say a word to each other. We talked to each other constantly, updated each other with what's going on. It was a constant, just there was not a moment of silence the whole time, four and a half hours of playing golf. It was great companionship. That's kind of what he's called us into with the, that Jesus is telling us he's going to put the Holy Spirit inside. That's what Paul's praying for us that we have companionship with the Holy Spirit. Do you have that? Take a look at, at the, uh, go down about seven or eight verses. Um, Acts 20, verse 23. Verse 22 actually is, it, it, let me back up just a second, in Acts. If you're looking for a th place of study in the Bible, let me encourage you to consider the book of Acts. What you're going to discover studying the book of Acts is what was very common for them is far often too, too uncommon for us. They were in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. They had companionship with the Holy Spirit. And so in, in Acts 23, Paul said that, that he was compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. That was in verse 22, I didn't put it in here, but he, but he felt compelled by the Holy Spirit. He knew the nudging. And then he says, I only know that in town after town, the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions await me. So he had companionship with the Holy Spirit. They were talking, the Holy Spirit let him know, hey, look, we have some work to do, but I want you to know what's coming up ahead. You're not gonna, you don't have to be shocked by it. It's part of what my brother and I were talking about in the cart. Now that we were hitting our 60s, what's kind of lot, what's laying ahead? What's going on with us right now? Those are, those are the type of things that you do with companionship. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do with us. 
The Holy Spirit's alive. He's inside of us. He's part of who we are. So companionship is a, is, is a, is a big part of it. The second part of, uh, of the word koinia is fellowship. Is, is, I'm sorry, is partnership. There's a partnership that we have with the Holy Spirit. There's a, there's a certain flow that happens with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm, I'm a golfer, and so I play in a member guest tournament. There's a guy named Bob Vernay who works for Monsanto, and uh, he taught me tournament golf. So he was able to take the competitive spirit I had in baseball and say, here's how this works on the golf course when you play tournament golf. And so this goes back 15 years ago. And I actually learned to love tournament golf. And so when he and I play together, we'll win nine out of 10 tournaments. And the only reason we do is because of the partnership that we have. I don't have to get mad when he says that's good to somebody because we've already agreed beforehand. Within four feet, give him the putt. Don't have him grind over a putt. Who cares? But what he taught me is that in simple thing in golf, don't think about what the other team's doing. Just go for the flag. Play the course. And let them chase us <laughs> and watch what happens. And so we just have this flow and partnership where we both relax on the golf course where usually in tournaments guys tighten up even more. It's just a partnership that we have. I have a partnership with my wife. Last week we were in the, in the uh, restaurant, and there were, eight of, or there were about 14 of us all talking. And all of a sudden, I heard my wife's voice. It's like my brother was talking to me, and I could hear my wife's voice. I was like, so I turned around, I looked through this little slit, because there was a dividing wall, and sure enough, she was in a booth over there with my sister-in-law. <laughs> Didn't even know she was there. That's the type of thing that partnership is. By the way, she kind of sent all you guys a compliment because my brother and I decided that we would pick up her bill unbeknownst to them, and we told the waitress to tell the two guys wanted their phone number. And, <laughs> and so she did. The waitress did and said, she, I didn't think it was appropriate, so I didn't give it to him. So later in the day, I asked my wife, I said, how was breakfast? She said, oh, it was great. I said, where'd you go? She goes, well, that's curious. You didn't know where I was at. I go, why do you say that? And she said, because two gentlemen picked up our breakfast. I said, man, I heard that place is becoming a meat market over there. <laughs> but then she said, I just figured one of the guys from one thing must have picked up my breakfast. And then she, did, she actually named Ed Trezino. So that's what she thinks of you guys, a bunch of generous guys, right? <laughs> but see, we have a partnership, so I, so I know her voice. You know, I know her voice. So, you know, a few weeks back, John Woodall and I decided to go down and hear Ken Bo on a Wednesday morning. There was a topic he was talking about that we wanted to hear. So we met at 6 o'clock in the morning, and we did a 45-minute drive down to Buckhead. Now, in that 45 minutes, what do you think was going on in the car with John and I? Not a moment of silence. Why? Because we have a partnership. We're both in ministry for men. Our, both, our hearts pound the same way. We consider ourselves fellow soldiers. Let me ask you something. On the way here this morning, knowing that you were coming here, while you were in the car, how much conversation did you have with the Holy Spirit? He's in partnership with you. He's right there with you with what you're coming to hear, what's going to touch on your heart. Are you in conversation with the Holy Spirit? That's what Paul's praying for us, that we be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, that we're in companionship with him, that we're in partnership with him, that we know his voice, hear his voice. Look at the first verse on, on that going deeper side of the page. Acts 8, 29 to 30. The Spirit said to Philip. Now, if you read this, about four or five verses before that, it says that an angel told Philip where to go. I want you to go over here. And then Luke, who writes Acts, distinguishes the difference. Now he says the Spirit. So an angel basically guided him where to go. And now he says to Philip, go over to that chariot and, and stay by it. So Philip ran up and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you remember what you are, do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. So if you read the story, what happens, this is, this is actually a high-ranking guy in the chariot. He's the treasurer to, to the queen of Ethiopia. And the Holy Spirit said, hey, go over there and stand by that chariot. <laughs> and look at what's going on. He looks and he says, do you understand? If you, then if you read the rest of the story, Philip walks him through explaining what Isaiah prophesied and what Jesus just fulfilled. 
and how he needs to believe and be baptized. And then the Ethiopian says, hey, there's some water. How about baptizing me? And the guy accepts Christ. <laughs> that same spirit lives inside of us. Have you ever been with somebody who, who were, you're at the restaurant and all of a sudden he looks at the waitress and just starts sharing because the Holy Spirit nudged him? Now, I don't think that we have to speak to every, every waitress every time we're out to eat, but I think we ought to know the voice of the Holy Spirit that says, hey, share something that you have here. Do you hear that? Are you in fellowship? See, if I never talked to John Woodall on that whole drive down, or if I never talked to my brother in the golf court, eventually they'd stop talking to me too. He's like, this is a one-way deal. I ain't talking. Holy Spirit's no different. If we shut him down, he's not going to be talking back to us. But if we embrace it, if we understand what this is that Jesus gave us, he said, yeah, I didn't abolish the bar. The bar is still there. But the good news, I'm giving you something inside of you that you can do greater things than, I, than even I have done. I mean, think about the, the, the big crowds that went to see Jesus. How long did they stand in line? How long did they hope that they could get by him? How long did they wish that they got, can I just have one conversation? I have one question for you, Jesus. I, there's so many people around. How many days in a row would you have to get to before you could finally, if it, was a, if it was a numbering system, how long would it take, right? We don't have any of that. <laughs> He's inside of us. He gave us the Holy Spirit inside of us. So the Holy Spirit can have 10 million conversations going on in every different language on the face of the earth and answer every one of them instantaneously. This, you know how we're wired. I mean, we want, we like dropping names, right? When, when I played golf with, with uh, Trezino this this. Trevino, sorry, Ed. <laughs> I played golf with Ed Trevino. I was at the Green Bar and I played golf with, with Trevino. What a funny guy. What a great guy. You know, in the end, he gave us his phone number. I want to run around and tell people, Trevino wants to be my friend. <laughs> we had a similar experience. Uh, oh, I won't go into it. If you have, if you have people who are well-known and they want to be your friend, that, how do you feel about that, right? The third part of this, of, of what Paul is praying for us in fellowship with the Holy Spirit is intimacy, is that we have intimacy. Do you know that this same spirit, who if you pick up and read Genesis chapter one and go to verse two, it says the spirit of God hovered over the waters. The earth was a swamp. He hovered over the waters, and all of a sudden he said, let there be light. And creation started. So the same spirit that actually put the stars in the sky, right, in the planets, that spirit wants to be your friend. He wants to talk with you. He wants you to talk with him. He wants you to have companionship, partnership, intimacy with him. That's what he's offering us. And we ignore him. <laughs> We forget about it. It's like he's the Cinderella of the, of the Trinity. And that's what Jesus gave us so we could live this Christian life. Love is so important to him. We cannot love without the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot love someone the way we're supposed to love without the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, go back to, to the Sermon on the Mart. Jesus says, it's the golden rule. Love someone as if you love your, the same way that you love yourself. Jesus keeps raising the bar, but he gives us the power to do it. Take a look at, I mean, how do we know that he wants to be your friend? How do you know the Holy Spirit wants to be your friend? Go down to James 4, 4 through 5. Before I read it, let me say this. If my wife, I mean, my wife's probably my closest companion. Well, probably she is my closest companion, my closest partner, the person I'm most intimate with on this planet. She shares with me the secrets of her heart. She shares with me what's most important to her. She tells me what she'd like me to do. She encourages me. Now, if I decided that 
not only my wife, but I want to have a relationship with this other woman over here. Do you think Sandy would keep doing that with me? Do you think she would still share with me the secrets of her heart and we would be that intimate? Listen to what the Holy Spirit says. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever chooses to be friend of the world renders himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scriptures say without reason that the spirit is caused to dwell in, the, the spirit he caused to dwell in you, us, learn, yearns with envy? <laughs> the Holy Spirit yearns with envy for relationship with us. And when we give our relationship to the world, when we give our relationship to things that don't really matter, he's jealous. <laughs> it pains his heart. It grieves him. Sometimes awareness helps us fix the problem. But do you know what the cool thing is? He helps us fix that very same problem. All we got to do is tell him. <laughs> so we need to send it to the table. But what I want to encourage you to do is spend some time on these verses which talk about the Holy Spirit. Read through Acts where time after time they hear his voice. They were so intimate with him that sometimes they just knew. Look at, look at that Acts 15 verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon, lay upon you no further burden except these necessary things. They were so in tune with the Holy Spirit they knew what the Holy Spirit wanted. It seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. Have you ever said that? As I've thought about this, it seemed good to me and the Holy Spirit. That is the direction we go. It aligns with his work. It aligns with what he's doing. The message for this morning is to realize that, guys, yes, there's a bar. That's, that can be a religious bar apart from the Holy Spirit. And God did not call us to religion. He called us to relationship. So he expects us to live a certain way. He expects us to obey his commandments because we love him. And then he gives us the empowerment for him to love, to love him by putting the Holy Spirit inside of us. And now he invites us into relationship with him, to hear his voice, to know that his voice does speak. Turning to the left, to the right, a little small voice will tell you what to do. We have to be in tune with it, but we need God's word to be the grounding point for all that to balance us off, to know that, yes, that is the Holy Spirit. Yes, that, that wasn't the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's not his voice. That's not what he would say. But that is. an open up conversation. What does that look like? It looks like that's how you just start. You just start with conversation. I can't do this on my own. I need this pole. If I'm going to live this life to get over the top of that, I need the help to do it. Help me with this. Give me the desire. God says that he will give us the desires of our heart. That doesn't mean we have desires and say, God, give me what I desire. It means that God will give you a desire. <laughs> He'll change who you are, change your desires into the man that, he, that he's called you to be. What a gift. What tremendous intimacy. Shut off the radio, shut off the news, talk to the Holy Spirit in the car wherever you're going. Help him prepare you for whatever you're going to. Listen to him and watch what happens. I mean, I, I encourage, we'll be talking about this a little bit at the table. I still get a chill up my spine when I'm told to, when I'm told to turn around and have a conversation with that, that girl behind the counter at BP. That's what happens. And amazing things happen. And then you walk out and say, boy, I wouldn't have cool what I just did. You're humble because you realize that God just whispered in my ear to encourage his girl to share what I know. Wow. Now you're totally in line with his work. That's what he called us to do. All right, let's go to the tables.
right, so let me hear a little bit from the tables. What did you talk about? What are, what are some of the daily functions of the Holy Spirit that you embrace, that you appreciate, that you want even more of? Some of the daily functions of the Holy Spirit. What did you talk about at the table? Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The Holy Spirit helping us do that. All right. Yeah, no doubt, right? Because we want to go the other direction. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Dan? Comfort and hope. Yeah. Yeah, where, we are, where are we without that, right? Encouragement. Peace. Discernment. Love, yeah, right, right. You know, it's so easy for us to uh, grab things on our own. I found myself doing that this week for a second. I was sharing with the table. I got a phone call, and it was going to disrupt my schedule. And immediately I went to this thing of, okay, I got to cancel that and cancel this and do this and do that. And it was stuff I know God called me to do. So I just looked at Sandy. I said, let's just pray for a second and ask the Holy Spirit to help us figure out what to do. And I'm telling you, we got done praying. It all came together. It was just, it's, you know, because he does that. Uh, Joe at our table shared that his experience is, you know, too often has been that he'll t- tune into Holy Spirit Radio every now and then. And sometimes that's our experience because we just want to control it, right? You know, the Old Testament, that's kind of how things were. If you, if you look at uh, the experience that Abraham had, Abraham had fellowship with God. He was a companion. He was a partner. He had intimacy. And so... Jesus showed up and he said, hey, we're going to take out Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, whoa, whoa, wait a second. (laughs) What if there's 50 believers? Can you spare them for that? What if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if there's 10? And this conversation goes on and God God says, okay. (laughs) If there's 10, I'll spare it. Let me ask you something. Do you ever have conversations with God like that about your kid? How about, how, how about we work together? How about you get in partnership with the Holy Spirit on how you're fathering your children, how you're leading your family? Conversation. How about if we, God, can we work together on this? Moses on the mountain had that same type of thing. Right? God said, I'm so tired of the Israelites, I'm taking them all out. They're gone. <laughs> don't do that, God. <laughs> For your own name's sake, don't do that. Because all the nations are going to say, who wants to follow that God? Look what he did. And it says God changed his mind. (laughs) But they had that type of level of conversation. Are you talking with the Holy Spirit like that about everything in your life? That open, that real, that back and forth and say, guide me. You know, Ed just said, (laughs) take everything. What squelches the Holy Spirit? What squelches it in our life? Ego will do that. (laughs) Pride is... Lack of faith, right? Yeah. Yeah, give them permission to speak in their life. Take a look at the third verse on your card. It says, and we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. (laughs) Obedience is part of the avenue that he enters in. A group this size, there's going to be guys that are holding on to something. I know that. You think that happiness is somewhere other than what God puts out there. And so you want to change the bar. You want to lower the bar. I did that for a while. I knew that what's in that room over there worked for me. So I lowered the bar. And rather than being filled with the Holy Spirit, I filled myself up with an instant fix. (laughs) And it works for a little bit. But once I asked God to change my desire, because I tried, I tried. When my wife busted me, I tried as hard as I could to break that on my own. I couldn't do it. In my own flesh, I could not do it. When I said, Holy Spirit, give me the desire of my heart. Make me have a desire not to want that, but to want you. You said I should be filled with you instead of that. So you have to fill me and give me that same feeling which I need, the peace, the comfort, (laughs) that everything's okay, that you can just calm. Give me that. Do you know what it says in Hebrews? If you want to come to God, you must first believe that he is, and then he'll be a rewarder to you. So what I'm saying is give him a shot. That's what I ended up saying to Sandy. You know what? I'm all in. I am all in, but I'm going to be real getting all in. If this is really true, God will show it to me. I'm going to surrender. 
I'm going to obey. I'm going to give. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this stuff. And let's just see what really what happens. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit radio turned on constantly. It's amazing what how, the, the change that takes place. When Paul says you're a new, all, all things have gone away. You're a new creature. All things are new. This is what he's talking about. When the spirit of life comes inside of us, Jesus said, it's a good thing I'm leaving. I have to leave you guys. Because when I leave, then God, then the Father will send the Holy Spirit. What Abraham experienced in that little conversation, what Moses experienced, that's what we have every single day. It's like, do we embrace that? That's the power that we have. Jesus said, you're going to do more than I ever did because of what he puts inside of us. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Along those lines, there's a verse that doesn't seem like it fit, okay? <laughs> but I felt like the Holy Spirit said, put this in here. So I know this is for somebody. <laughs> Take a look at Psalm. It's actually Psalm 139. I'm going to tell you how much I think the Holy Spirit doesn't want, that the, our enemy didn't want this in here. I put down 138. Walter called me and said, no, it's 119. <laughs> we both had fat fingers pushing the wrong number. It's Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18. It says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I count them, they would outnumber the sand. Now, let me tell you something. This is how we're wired, guys, and I know it. When we blow it, we think we've blown it. And because we blew it, we think we're disqualified. And so we walk around with a defeated attitude, thinking, God can't use me. Look what I've done. I blew it. If I could go backwards, I'd do it all over again, but I can't. And then we sulk, and Satan's the accuser of the brethren, and he has us in a defeated state. But God says that his thoughts about us outnumber the sand. Outnumber the sand. Now, I'm going to tell you something. On this planet, the person that I think about the most is my wife. If you took all the thoughts I've ever had about my wife and put them in a shoebox, it's probably, I mean, one... One shoe box. Do you know how many grains of sand there are if you filled one, soup, one, one shoe box? 13.1 billion. <laughs> That's what I read online. 13.1 billion grains of sand fit in a shoe box. <laughs> God is telling us, <laughs> God is telling us, his thoughts for us outnumber the sand. Think of all the sand on every beach, on every golf course, and every kid's play box, whatever's for sale at Home Depot, all those grains of sand. His thoughts for us outnumber that. Dave Pridemore said it like this. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. Do we realize that? Can we start with that? Can we start with the great love that God has for us and then embrace it? and say, wow, and start fresh there. And if you've got anything to lay down, lay it down. Lay it down. Yeah, that bar is high. But in love, we want to get over it. We want to do the things he wants us to do, and he gives us the pole to get over it. So whatever is blocking you, let me just say, make, this, make, make today today. Whatever that is, if you think that that porn site is just going to give you so much happiness, you know it's a lie. You know how you feel afterwards. You know the promises you make, you're never going to go back there again, and then somehow you do because you can't do it in your flesh. Tap into the Holy Spirit that's inside you to change your desire. Say, I don't want that. Whatever it is that has you, whatever it is that you know is standing in the way between you and, and a great relationship with God and a flowing of the Holy Spirit in you, put it down. And let's be men who really live well and finish well, live an abundant life, love well, and, and They'll know we're his disciples by how we love, by who we are, by how we love. And then we're hearing the voice. We're in tune to his voice. And he will speak, and he will guide. And guess what? He gifts us for what he empowers us to do. So it's not even hard. <laughs> He's given us natural gifting, supernatural gifting, spiritual gifting, to do whatever it is he calls us to do. And I'll just ask him what to do. And quit churning. Quit doing stuff because you think you should do it. Quit doing stuff because you th think that's what what's going to make you happy to make God happy? Ask him. He'll tell us. That's how intimate he is. That's the type of man he wants us to be. We just have to lay down everything and surrender and listen and fill yourself up with God's word.
Now you're giving the Holy Spirit something to work with. Because that's truth. That is absolute truth. Love the word. Get in love with, fall in love with the word. If, you, if you're starting up, go to Acts. Read Acts and watch how common it was for the Holy Spirit to be so intimately involved. Same thing. Go to Jesus' teachings. A new world, a different way of thinking that Jesus brought. Embrace it. Let the Holy Spirit just, but start by saying, teach me, Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> he's our rabbi. And he lives inside of us. Glory be to God, huh? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you that anything and everything that you've called for us to be and do, that you've empowered us to do because of this Holy Spirit, this gift that you put inside us. Thank you that in your wonderful plan, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all equal, triune God, that you put a piece of you inside of us, that you give us this living, active Holy Spirit. I pray that there will be conviction in the room where there needs to be. I pray that there'll be freedom in the room where there needs to be. I pray that There'll be forgiveness asking for a turning, that there'll be a cleansing, but then there'll also be vision and empowerment, and that we will serve you in a mighty way. And those around us will say, wow, <laughs> wow. There's something there that you have that I want. And it's so easy, you can help them get it. So Father, help us with all that. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for thinking about us so much. Thank you for being so intimately involved in each one of our lives. Help us to be the men you've called us to be. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.